Okay, so welcome to everybody. Uh, this is uh, the 10th and uh, last uh, seminar that we have been uh, organizing through the InvestMed project, uh, co-organized by LUMSA University and the Euro-Mediterranean Economist Association. Uh, today, the topic um, is uh, sustainable finance and entrepreneurship. And um, in, my, in, in my opinion, it's one of the uh, most interesting topics that are uh, right now uh, around the sustainability and the um, implementation of uh, different uh, business models aligned to sustainable criteria. So my name is Cynthia Chave. I'm a project coordinator at uh, EMEA. And uh, I am pleased to, to moderate this session and uh, also to present to you the, uh, the three uh, speakers that we have today. Our panel is uh, composed by three of, uh, of them. They are experts in uh, also tackling uh, sustainable finance from different perspectives. So uh, I'm glad to, to, to have you uh, all of them here. So let me uh, start uh, with uh, Tania Duarte. She's a sustainability consultant. She's a, a research fellow also at EMEA and her main research, uh, it's uh, dedicated to sustainable finance and sustainable development. She's co-author of international publications and conduct recent culture and banking. She's also co-author of the book, The Financial Sector and the Sustainable Growth, the, uh, the New Finance for the 21st Century. So she uh, holds an MBA in finance uh, from uh, Porto Business Schools and also a post-graduation degree in sustainable development. Uh, Tanya, you will uh, guide us a first uh, uh, vision about what it is uh, sustainable finance, and then we will go into uh, more deep uh, details with the, with the next panelist. Please, the floor is yours. Hey, thank you, Cynthia. Um, let me try to share the, the screen. Um, just for a second, sure. I think I'm sharing the screen right now. Yes, very good. So, um, so good morning. Thank you, Cynthia, for the introduction. And thank you, everyone, for participating in this webinar. I'm going to start with the topic of sustainable finance, as Cynthia mentioned, as it represents a catalytic power for the achievement of the energetic transition, environmental protection, and social development. Maybe there's something reason to think. Okay. So, in mainstream economics, the social and environmental factors have been traditionally considered as not relevant to the business plans of projects, products, and companies, and were generally dismissed as externalities. However, when deciding whether an entrepreneur is worthy of receiving funding, a sustainable finance pro financial provider would take into consideration its social and environmental impact in addition to their financial performance. This would provide a better and more integrated assessment of an enterprise in the long term, bearing in mind the lasting benefit of the client, but also the society at large. In a nutshell, sustainable finance means better development and better finance. Better development as development that is concerning the long economic sustainability, uh, there is sustainable in each of its economic, social, and environmental dimensions, and better finance, and as, as an overall financial system that is focused on the longer term stability, as well as material, environmental, social, and governance factors, and its role in which they operate, that addresses rising social inequalities and respects planetary boundaries. The global financial crisis exposed the urgency of financial sector to acknowledge environmental, social, and governance crisis risks. Sorry, has also the urgency to give purposefulness to its role in creating value in a meaningful, positive impact to shareholders, stakeholders, society, and real economy. Sustainable development includes a strong green component 
other sustainable criteria are often less prominent, but they should not be neglect neglected as they can potentially contribute directly or indirectly to the transition towards a new economic model that support the, the development of a more environmentally low carbon and climate resilient economy. But how can the needed change to, to achieve sustainable development be accelerated? Sustainable finance can accelerate the transition to a low carbon and climate resilient, equitable and values based economy. These commitments and derivables have been identified under the Paris Agreement, which stresses the urgency of global response to the threat of climate change, environmental degradation by lim limiting the temperature increase to 1.5 degrees Celsius and required the largest investment efforts. Additionally, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, which are a call to action to end poverty and inequality, protect the planet and ensure that people enjoy health, justice and prosperity, can be orientation points through their 17 goals associated with 169 targets and are designed to form a blueprint for good growth national and internationally by 2030. Green economy can serve as a vehicle to achieve the sustainable development goals. The integra integrated view of ecological, social and economic development can be concepted in a new way of being the sustainable development goals as seen in this image, known as wedding cake model for the sustainable development goals. Here, the foundation of economies and societies is a healthy biosphere with a second tier with goals related to a fair and just society and a third one related to the economy. It states that there are some non-negotiable sustainable development goals, such as the goal six on clean water and sanitation, Goal, 60, goal 13 on climate action, goal 14 on conservation and sustainability use of ocean, seas and marine resources, and goal 15 on life and land, which focus on managing forests sustainably, halting and reversing land and natural habitat degradation, combat desertification and stopping biodiversity loss. According to the authors, this model illustrates the effort towards making the economy serve society within the safe operating space of the planet. So the concept of green economy is not new and there is no international agreed definition or consensus about the subject, but it underscores the economic dimension of sustainability. However, the green economy might provide a response to the multiple crises that the world has been facing in recent years climate, food, and economic crisis, with an alternative paradigm that offers the promise of growth while protecting the planet's ecosystems and contribute to poverty alleviation. Sustainable development implies that economic development is both inclusive and environmentally sound, and to be undertaken in a manner that does not deplete natural resources such as the oceans, on which societies depend on in the long term. The blue economy is central to the green ecosystem as oceans influence all natural cycles and are also involved with economy, with economic sectors directly, for example, fisheries sectors, or indirectly such as energy, agriculture, tourism, waste and water management. Therefore, the blue component of the green transition to a more sustainable global economy cannot be overlooked. As they say, you cannot go green without blue. The Mediterranean region is widely recognized as one of the world's most sensitive and at environmental, social, economic, political, and cultural levels. A key challenge for green economy business involves reducing the unsustainable use of natural resources, improvement of resource efficiency, and adoption of clean environmental technologies and industrial process. Its development would ensure the implementation of innovations in sustainable production systems and environmentally 
resilience practices. The job creation that could arise that could arise from small and medium-sized enterprise faces a challenge on development of the skills, knowledge, and competences required by green economy and their integration in business and communities. Small and medium enterprises can contribute both to sustainable growth by providing jobs in accordance with environmental requirements, as well as in areas that would strengthen tools for the transitioning to a green and blue economy, such as the technical support, legislative, fiscal regularity, and any with a sustainable dimension, and to inclusive growth by making jobs accessible to vulnerable people, as well young people with skills on information computer technology solutions. The Mediterranean is facing systemic risks due to environmental pressures and the physical impacts of climate change. The increased average temperatures, the changing patterns of rainfall, the sea level rise, and the risk of desertification will impact water resources, biodiversity, human health, and resource-based industries, such as agriculture, aquaculture, or fisheries, as well as services as, such as tourism. Approximately one third of the Mediterranean population is concentrated along these coastal regions. However, with population growth combined with the growth of coastal periurban hubs, generate multiple environmental pressures caused by increased demand for water, energy resources, carbon emissions, and other forms of pollution, waste generation, land use, and degradation of habitats. These pressures are amplified by activities such as tourism, which is often concentrated in, in coastal areas and obviously by climate change. Furthermore, the socioeconomic and political instability represent extraordinary changes for governance and makes the regional islands vulnerable to climate change. Climate change effects issues the need for adaptation strategies which include the managing of natural and human systems and mitigation strategies has the intervention, intervention to reduce drivers of climate systems, for example, reducing greenhouse gas emissions and adopting renewable energy sources like solar, wind, hydro, fuels, and sustainable use of land and forests. With regards to cooperation among different actors, there is a challenge, but also an opportunity in realizing synergies between the work of local, national, and regional players and stakeholders, as well as strengthening regional cooperation among relevant stakeholders group of business, for example, NGOs and policymakers, or even peers. Green business models build upon conventional business models. It is important to look to examples that demonstrate the value and the and viability of green business models in developing and emerging countries. However, the key challenge is to scale up and across the positive impacts across sectors and organizations. Scaling up will allow populations, especially economic vulnerable people to benefit from innovative ways to produce and consume green products and service in order to take advantage of the opportunity offered through green business models and multiply these green, these green business models. It is important for entrepreneurs and businesses, as well as supporting stakeholders to understand the scaling up process and associated factors. However, to develop, implement, and scale up green business models, there are technical, market, economic, regulatory, and other barriers to be aware in each country. It is certainly a big challenge for a green economic business to face those barriers, establishes a relationship between the policy targets and relevant environmental, social, and government dimensions and deliver products and service with a better economic, environmental, and social value proposition. And finally, the 
the access to sustainable finance last November at COP26 conference, one of the most important issues was green and climate finance. The concern about financing the green transition and avoid the climate and humanity catastrophes came along with the consciousness that hundreds of billions would be needed in the next decades, especially in developing countries. There's still the risk that traditional finance continue to do business as usual, even when try to present themselves as sustainable, which can be detrimental for green entrepreneurs for the access to investment from financial institutions. For green entrepreneurs, raising capital attract raising capital, attract private investment and or access to funding for their projects and business can be presented as limited without the needed support from public administrations and extended network. The access to sustainable finance is an enabler to empower Mediterranean small and medium-sized enterprises on social, environmental, and sustainable livelihoods. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tania. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I think it's a, a, a very good introduction to the topic. And as you're mentioning, right now we have a COP27 on next uh, November, where it will be crucial to make some step forward uh, mm -hmm. on this commitment from, uh, from the private sector, I will say. So all these uh, sustainable finance around uh, the implementation of uh, new infrastructures or the uh, um, the businesses that require to add their forces into this uh, transition in order to make it more uh, impactful, more mm -hmm. uh, in a transformative way. Thank you, Tanya. I will only ask you, so uh, from your point of view um, and, and the research that you are developing on the topic, which of the, of the regional uh, policies do you think could be uh, um, a good path to, uh, to encourage in the upcoming uh, years and decade? Well, there are, there are a few policies that um, some of them could relate to each other and some of them can kind of surpass, um, have different views. But I think one that is more important is to think about uh, the, 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 to start with, with, um, with ones that defend uh, what is in the base of society and economics, because without, without having an um, ecological healthy system, we cannot provide, uh, the, we cannot go to the second um, space to the society and help uh, to business to develop uh, and consider all these environmental, social and governance factors and also to have the results in the economy. So I think the police that defends and, and we, we can, we're still um, looking to the Paris Agreement, we're still looking at uh, the other deals that are made in different parts of the world and they are still connected with the, the first ones that were defined in COP21. So I think if we, we you know, keep it, to the to the, the the simple in the way that this is the main goal and we can develop from there. Um, I think there are the main the more important policies. I wouldn't mention any specific one or or name of the policy, but I think especially because um, there are different velocities in different parts of the world. We can see the progress that is made on, uh, in, for example, the difference that we see it would happen in Europe and would happen, for example, in the Mediterranean as itself. So um, try not to mention that specific, but I would say that we can look at the, the ones that start all these um, changes in terms of sustainability and sustainable finance. Thank you, Tanya. I think the scheme that you show about how uh, identifying or um, understanding the SDGs through the uh, economic society and the biosphere is uh, quite interesting. Thank you. So we will continue. Um, thank, I will, you. thank you. I will give now the floor to Kwame. Uh, he's a partner at K 
PMG in Ghana. He's um, internal uh, audit and risk and compliance uh, specialist and has uh, 18 years of uh, experience working across different dimensions in the internal audit. He has a very wide uh, knowledge around the risk assessment and management and how to apply precisely the ESG uh, methodology. So he will explain us uh, from his point of view and the, and the, and the work that they have been doing through um, through KPMG and um, and I will go directly to you, uh, Kwame. Please, I think that you have. Okay. Yes, yes, I'm here. So thank you so much, um, Cynthia. My video connection is not the best, so I'll probably speak off video, but I'll put, I'll do a yeah, no worries. So that, yeah. Okay. We can, I think that we can hear you, Kwame. Excellent. So yes, I'm, I'm projecting my screen. Uh, just give me a second. Uh, please confirm when you can see it. Yes, yes, we, yes we can see it. Thank you. Excellent. Right. So I think my outline is pretty uh, simple, but I just listened to Tanya. It's interesting that she, she's kind of gone through most of the things I'm going to say in, in the intro. So I probably really won't uh, spend too much time in the intro, but just to say that, um, if you look at the work we're doing in Ghana and even glo globally, I mean, ESG, how we term it, I mean, in sustainability is, is something that is really transforming the entire business environment and, and, and everything that we do. I think primarily we at KPMG, when we look at ESG, what we do is we say that it's a really new dynamic where businesses must look at risk and opportunities from a non-financial performance perspective. So now, the different stakeholders who are important and, and we'll, we'll look at them are looking at organizations strengths and resilience from other non-financial factors and, and this is super critical and i think a lot of this has already been mentioned by tanya uh in the just the components for the esg i think the environmental part for, for many of us is really common and and we really are aware of it um the social uh, impact part is also really common to most of us. But I think the new dynamic, which is really our license to operate, is the governance part, where it's simplified to say that you need the right governance structure to drive better business. Better business in, in the sense that as an organization, you realize the impact you're making to society, the impact you're making to an, your, your environment. And this must be spearheaded by the right governance structure. So for us, that's how we, we look at it. Now, this slide for me is crucial because the first thing to do is to identify the various stakeholders. And, and if you don't know what stakeholders are looking for as a business, you won't transform because we are all used to profit-oriented processes. Now, we, we do have, I mean, the customers who are really the, the, the heart of the value chain demanding ethical practices, responsible practices, right? And, and these things must be demonstrated clearly that we as an entity, we are giving our customers the, the, the right information. The capital market, I think is very, very, very uh, di di direct. Everybody sees that. I mean, if you want to get discounts, you want to access the capital market, you're going to be demanded to demonstrate your capacity and ability to have these ESG um, clear points. Now, regulators is, is what is really interesting because the regulators now are demanding that entity, and especially um, within the highly regulated industries like banks, insurance, and others. But I think as an entrepreneur, if a bank is looking to apply ESG principles, it's going to impact the way they view you, the way they treat you. So again, it's important to identify the different stakeholders and what ESG means to them. This, this slide is also um, another interesting one because there is a survey that we did, KPMG, uh, between 2022, sorry, 2021 and 2020. And um, it's part of our CEO outlook where we speak to CEOs about, I mean, key risk and opportunities that's impacting them. And it's, it's really interesting to see that if you compare 2020 to 2021, the, the key risk have changed dr dramatically. And if you, if you look at, for, for instance, 2021, you're now looking at cyber security risk 
and environmental climate change as a key top two. You even go to supply chain risk. Compared to 2020, where we had talent, supply chain, and then return uh, to terrorism. So you can see the di dynamic of environmental is becoming very, very, very strong. The supply chain point is becoming very, you need to understand how, what impact your partners are, are having on society. So this is really to give you the, the, the sense that the overall business dynamics is changing towards cybersecurity, environmental, social and governance issues. Now, the, the case here to have entrepreneurs or entities adopt ESG, I think is something that is clear. Just to summarize a few of those points, research have shown that companies that are ESG pro are typically more resilient. They're resilient because they take time to understand their risk and opportunities. They take time to understand things that are uncertain about what they do. And therefore they typically can maneuver whatever obstacles that are coming. For instance, we, we, we just had COVID, right? There may not be another COVID, but there, there will definitely be another catastrophe. But the question is co companies that are really aware of how, what impact they make, how they run their business on the governance side, how they impact society and the environment are typically more resilient. And again, this point here about improving risk management is a fundamental point in running the business. Risk management is not necessarily a bad thing. Well, what it is, risk is basically the uncertainty with regards to you achieving an objective. So the more intelligent you are about a particular happening towards your objective, the stronger you are, the more sustainable you are as a business. Growth becomes more sustainable and better because you have clarity of your suppliers, your stakeholders. You're able to manage your, for instance, your finances better and you get good rates. I mean, we've done work here in Gagana where we've done sustainability assurance work where banks are giving significant haircuts to entities who are demonstrating some ESG, ESG principles. And, and this is something that we've done here in Ghana locally. Now, how do you as a business go about integrating this whole ESG principles into your business? Believe me, this is a cultural shift. I mean, it is really, a, and a culture shift is not something that you just approve policies and move on. You must change mindsets. You, you must change how you do things and you must change what is important to you, right? So the typical uh, process goes through really assessing where you are today against where you need to be. And the benchmark must be looked at through the lens of something like the U U UN Sustainable Goals or things that will make you more responsible as an entity. You have to assess that and understand from a materiality perspective, where are you as a business? You now move on to say, how do I design over the long term period? As I, as I said, there's a cultural change. So it's not something that's going to happen tomorrow. How do I design a framework or a strategy that's going to support my overall implementation that will fit your model? Again, there will be guidance from regulators and other um, um, ESG um, the, the, the directors, but you as a business must understand your own unique value propositions and how you want to get there through your ESG strategy. Now to operationalize it is where the challenges are. To, it basically means changing how you do business, changing what is important to you and getting people within the critical elements of your business to think and act differently. And, and this operationalization is typically where the hard work is. What do you reward internally, externally? Who do you partner with? What message do you, do you put out there? And the last part is the measurement where you're able to really assess your progress objectively and even go to the, to the level where you're doing assurance work, you're getting entities to come and even validate some of the statements that you're putting out there. And this generally is like a framework that we recommend to go through that maturity process. And again, along all these things must come with good data because data becomes a serious issue when you need to really report and measure some, some of these things. It's always better to leverage technology to ensure that you have the right technology and also policies and procedures obviously must come in to drive consistency and drive that change within um, that defined set of, of, of processes. Now, 
as I speak about this value chain, the, the, the critical thing that comes to mind is the challenges that you will see or things that we have seen in the, in the market for entities that have to try to adopt this whole framework. I think that the, the first one is the governance, which is probably the most important. I mean, getting your roles and responsibilities clearly defined in response to your overall ESG objectives. Getting your board members and senior executives to understand the value and why it is to transform and move from just uh, normal uh, profits to other impacts that in the long term will make the company better. The second one is being able to put together a strategy and, and, and embed the ESG strategy with your current strategy. Typically, as a, as a business, you probably have a medium to long, long, long term strategy. Now, embedding that strategy into your ESG strategy sometimes becomes really challenging. So you need to really do, do a diagnostic, as I said earlier, and, and make sure that that, that that mapping is done really well. I've mentioned this already, data accessibility. You need to de develop a data management framework to ensure that you know what data you're capturing and, and you, you're, you're getting yourself comfortable with regards to the quality of the data. And this data is typically a huge issue. Why do you think this data is correct? How would other people look at it? What do you need to report? And the, and the disclosures again becomes um, the, 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 the good thing is that I think as uh, this has become a, a, a huge craze going, most of the regulators and others are now converging to make sure that the disclosures are around certain specific KPIs. And then I think as we move on to uh, early part of next year, we'll see GRI and others. Um, I mean, co 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 combine and make sure that the, the, these discussions are easier and clearer for everybody to, to, to monitor. Now, just moving a bit on to, and again, as I said, uh, a lot of the, these were spoken about, just moving on to the sustainable finance for entrepreneurship from the, the, these plans. As I've just spoken to you with regards to why ESG, what ESG is, the process to get there. And I've also touched on some of the challenges. I think uh, as a business, it is really, really important to understand that the traditional business mo models are gonna be very, very different than today. And these business models are not sustainable because we don't typically know the impact that we are making on society, okay? Investors and portfolio holders, I mean, are demanding things differently. There's a huge focus now on renewable energy resources, Policymakers, regulators are driving this agenda, so nobody can run away from it, right? Nobody can run away from it. Everything here, I think I've spoken about it. We lack clarity around this green financing. So as an entity, you need to seek this clarity and you need to tap into regulators. I think one of the things that uh, most regulators struggle with is that when they put out directives or regulations, Entities pick them up and they want to do a checkbox exercise instead of trying to implement them within their own fra frameworks, right? There's a huge maturity mismatch. I mean, with regards to entities and regulators drives and also the green financing um, framework, this maturity mismatch makes it a bit challenging to really uh, align the, 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 the requirements of entrepreneurs and also those uh, financiers. Now, this is just um, another survey from a report in 2019, the UN participation um, for action on green economy. It's quite interesting. Um, there was a study done on green finance in Ghana. And, and, and what you see here is that the, the, the high scale, which is a red one, you see that there's um, points around the maturity mismatch, which is clear, as I discussed earlier, the lack of domestic green investors um, and and I, I would assume that some of these points are still relevant to your your jurisdictions as well. Um, lack of the requisite technology to drive this and improve that whole sense of transparency and the and disclosure. These are all challenges that I mean were identified through this uh, study that was done here in Ghana. Now, this slide is is what should, should give us all comfort that. There's a significant emergence of, of, of the green financing. And if you, if you look at this, the, the trend, sustainable green debt that's I mean, issued globally 
went from 250 million to 700 billion in 2020, just in a matter of two years. It's projected to go up to about $5 trillion in 2025. This creates great opportunity for all of us to tap into it. And, and as I said, if you think through the mismatch, we as entrepreneurs and other stakeholders must all ramp our knowledge around this whole green financing to ensure that we leverage and tap into this opportunity. With this 700 billion bond, I can tell you that the entities that were, were ready and capable to take advantage of it were, were, were not much because of, the, because of the maturity mismatch. So this is just to indicate the, how vibrant and how important this um, sustainable financing uh, process is. Now in conclusion, I think um, what I've done is taking you through uh, a segment of ESG, really to telling you that the governance part is what is your, is your license to operate because it's gonna drive everything you do from the social and environmental part. As a business, you can't sit and wait for regulators to give you any the direction or whatever. You need to be proactive. You need to embrace it because the opportunity in there is huge. And if you if you if you get that sense early and then drive that, it will improve your business and eventually you have a more robust and resilient business. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kwame. Thank you very much for this uh, presentation. And to go in more in the detail about what it is about the ESGs, I think that let's uh, remember that uh, our main audience today, we have uh, colleagues that are, uh, have been uh, developing the, through the training program um, organized by uh, Lungsa University on the, under the framework of the investment project. And they have been um, uh, looking how to uh, drive and to, to prepare their business ideas in order to uh, achieve a more uh, alignment to uh, green and environmental uh, approaches. So for sure, I just uh, want you to, um, to ask you because you mentioned one thing that it's, uh, I think it's crucial uh, about being uh, in a resilient uh, thinking approach. That means that um, even though that they are starting a business idea, even though that they are um, developing and implementing an action plan in this in this thing, um, it is important to be well prepared for uh, any any uh, um, circumstances, uh, uncertain things that could appear. Right. So, from your experience, Kwame, uh, what do you think that uh, now, um, from an entrepreneurship point of view, what would you um, recommend or um, for them to, to take a special attention. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Big question. So I think uh, it's, it's super critical for entrepreneurs to really, first of all, understand the impact of this whole ESG. And specifically, the, the point I'm making is that entrepreneurs should really understand the regulatory drive and the, what is expected of them from a regulator and especially the, 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 the financiers, what are they looking for? They're not looking for just simple words that I made this impact. They, they really want to see that the leadership of their entities are totally involved and understand the overall direction, that there's a deep commitment. At the end of the day, it's all about commitment. As I mentioned earlier, it's a cultural transformation. So nobody expects you to move from A to Z in six months. Okay. Thank you, Kwame. I think, uh, okay. The so demonstration of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The demonstration of that will be, will be having an ESG strategy developed in hand. Say that this is my strategy. This is my long-term strategy. So th this is one thing that I would say that everybody should rally around getting a strategy to develop. Thank you. Thank you, Kwame. Okay, so we'll look back uh, again with you. Uh, there is a few questions on the chat. I uh, suggest to all uh, the attendees, please to, to put them out. When uh, at the end of the panel, we will uh, read them and, and, and uh, others to each one of our panelists. So let me introduce you now um, to our colleague, uh, Laura. Laura Siso. Yeah, Miro. She's... Uh, She's entrepreneur and founder of uh, four companies. Uh, she's CEO at Bridge the Gap, and she's passionate about clean technologies and business creation. She has been a professional on uh, energy, 
Um, and currently she works closely with the deep tech uh, startups to contribute to the projects going from lab, uh, from a pilot to, to market. So through consultancy, uh, bridge the gap. So she uh, has a wide experience uh, engaging uh, European public funds through uh, research and development and innovation projects. And um, of which 90% of, of those uh, for deep tech uh, startups for the, from the programs EIC, the Accelerator Horizon Europe, uh, SME instrument, um, EIT health and funding support for third parties. So Laura, she will give us more uh, an idea for uh, or a guidance how to address uh, this entrepreneurship and to, to drive into a, a more proper way. Please, Laura, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, thank you, Cynthia, for the presentation. I'm going to share my screen. Um, it's here. Uh, please just confirm that everything is okay. Do you see my screen? Yes, yes, yes. very good. Oh, okay, well, uh, good morning to, to everybody. My pitch today is uh, directed to entrepreneurs that have the idea to bring an innovation to the market. And well, in this path uh, from the idea to the market, surely you will need to explain, to tell a story. E to do that, um, well, it's very important to prepare uh, a good, sorry, I think it don't work. Okay, it's important to prepare your pitch. Uh, what will be this story? Why is this important? Why is um, why do you need to invest energies, resources, and times to prepare your excellent pitch? Because at the end, this pitch it's your uh, first presentation to your potential investors. Mm, at the end, you want to raise money from them. You want to create confidence on them in order they invest their money in your idea, in your business, and your team. And this is a matter of meeting, connection, and matching. And at the end, you will put on your boat someone that will be working close to you for a long time. Then, this is a matter, this is a question of persuasion. Um, and today I will give you some guidelines uh, about how to reach it. I will divide my presentation in two parts. In first one, I will give you seven tips to rise this persuasion. On the second part, I will give you a structure of your pitch deck of your slides, slides, slides presentation based on a seven minutes uh, pitch deck. Well, first of, all, first of all, communication is what the listener does. In fact, you are going to tell a story, but the important thing is the story, okay? But the most relevant thing is the listener. If you don't know your listener, nothing will work. You will know, you will, you need to know what is he expecting and how to connect your story with the listener and how to connect your story also with your goals and, and make the match between both things. In that sense, it's very important you know your audience. You know to uh, have a clear idea about what they will expect from you and you have to keep the attention. This is a challenge. This is not silly thing. But also, um, I my advice is not to link only with the rationale. Uh, probably your investor is looking for a return of investment. Uh, it's about numbers. But I am sure that in the early stage financing rounds, in the seed uh, rounds, most of the decisions are linked with emotion. Then with your pitch deck, you have a great opportunity on that. My recommendation is you need to connect with a common, a common feeling of common people. 
for instance, if you are talking, if you are creating a business, a business related um, with uh, pollution, how to reduce the pollution in the world? Well, try to connect with the with the sons of your audience. Uh, everyone have a son, or everyone have been son. Then, surely the your audience, the investors in in your in the public are worried about how to bring a better world for the future. Connect with this universal truth. Other example, for instance, if, if you are making something um, to, um, to reduce the pollution in the air, uh, then uh, try to connect with health. Health is also something that uh, worries to the common people. Try to connect with the cancer effects uh, that uh, pollution is causing. Then, um, this is something that you have to keep in mind in your pitch. The third point is about simplicity, clarity, and focus. Less is more. This is a, this is a real principle that always works. Keep few ideas, but keep it very clear. It's difficult because um, entrepreneurs uh, want to explain a lot of things. They are in love of their business. It's good that it must be in that way. But remember that the most important thing is the listener and the time of the listener. Then do not lose time of the listener explaining things that are, uh, that are not valuable. I want to bring you an example. One of the consultants on, on, on pitch making, uh, relevant consultants from Silicon Valley, his name is uh, Brendan Baker. Uh, he's an entrepreneur, consultant, and also he's an amateur photographer. He prepared a pitch uh, presenting his portfolio as photographer, and he brings only three, um, three pictures of his uh, work as photographer. And the public said, okay, well, he's an amazing photographer. He's excellent, he's great, he's very amazing. Then he tried to put 10 pictures of his, of, uh, of his uh, portfolio in another presentation. And then the audience said, well, okay, he's a pretty good photographer. And finally, he did another trial and he put about 100 pictures of his portfolio. And the result of the audience was the following. Oh, okay, he's an average photographer with only three good pictures. Well, then the message is keep simple, keep only the ideas that are valuable, put all the stuff that is not uh, relevant is not a highlight. And also another recommendation is try to attract the attention of the investors for the question part, because always you have uh, a time for pitch and always you have a time for questions. Well, next message is to build conscious statements. Be professional from the beginning. Say only the things that provide content and provide message avoid buzzwords, avoid, avoid uh, paid phrases, and be determined. I am here, this is who I am, this is what I am going to do, and this is, uh, those are my achievements. Be clear and be determined about what are you presenting to the investors. Next step, you have to provide certainty confidence and credibility. The most easy way to do that is to support on data, on facts, and on some hypotheses. Probably you will need to present information about the future, what will be your forecast on sales, what will be your forecast on the market, on the future market. Okay, you are guessing, but if you based on data, on sound hypotheses, on credible hypotheses, then you will build this credibility around your story. One, one thing 
uh, that help to do that is related with my next recommendation. Cross the river on the stepping stones. When you are saying to the investors that are you are going to achieve uh, different milestones and different goals, and a lot of them of that, a promise that will you do the next achievement uh, based, supported on your existing achievement. Uh, have a clear milestone roadmap. Where are you going? Where, where are you pretending to arrive? But show a clear idea about where are you at the where are you at the moment, and how will you do the next uh, the next step, the next jump? If you base this information on the achievements that you have already uh, achieved, that you that you have at the moment, you will build this credibility that it's very very important to convince your investors. And finally, show because you are unique. There are a lot of entrepreneurs. Investors see thousands of pitch deck uh, along the year. Um, most of them provide credibility. Most of them, based on facts, most of them promise brilliant solutions. But if you want that, if the investor remind you, if you want the investor be uh, eager about knowing more about your business and your ideas, you have to be very clear because your idea is unique and it's different from the existing products, existing solutions on the market worldwide. Well, from here is my part of the presentation, and now we I am going to start the, the second part. It's uh, it's more applied, and well, it, uh, it gives you uh, an overview about uh, what information you can include in your slides in your pitch deck for a seven minutes pitch deck structure. First of all, you need to talk about the problem. What is the pain? of your potential customers. This is crucial for the investor. If the investor do not understand it from the beginning, from the first 10 seconds, 20 seconds, then your story is completely uh, overthrown, like a sun castle. Uh, then you have to need a clear message about uh, what is, the market opportunity, how big is it? Because there is explain why there is a problem, why there is a pain in the potential uh, client segments you, do you aim to, to tackle to the others. This is the first thing that um, you have to put the effort on make it very, very clear. Secondly, go to the solution. Do not lose time of your listener. Why are you, are you, how will you uh, make, uh, provide a solution to this uh, real crucial problem? Um, how will you solve the pains of your clients? And how will you bring some gains, some additional benefits uh, to, your, to your clients? and also explain in which status you are. Uh, important, if you have traction, traction is the, is the goal for the investors. If you have traction, show it from early in the beginning in your slides. Put the logos of your clients, of your customers. If, um, if, in spite it's only maybe a pilot or if you are uh, developing some minimum viable product, it don't mind. If you have a, a proof of willingness to pay from a potential customer, if you can uh, show that you have already validated your idea and the market interest uh, by, by, a, by a proof, by a, by a conceptual project, by a letter of interest, show early from the beginning. 
do not wait uh, until your uh, time is right. Early in the beginning, mm, it's the it's it's a perfect time to show that you already have traction. Then talk about who are you, which is your team. Remember that the team it's not positions in a or, or organigram chart, organization chart. Team is people. Uh, what is his uh, background? What is his track record? Uh, is the people in your has the people in your team experience in building another business? Has the people in their team experience in sales, technical experience? Which other companies they have been involved in? And also uh, talk about your partners. Team is also partners. Who are, who is trusting in you? Have you been participating in another in acceleration programs? Have you received awards? Have you another investors on board already? Show all of, all of these because it provides proof that uh, somebody have already trust in you. Uh, somebody have already assessed your business in the same way that the, your existing audience, your potential future investors are assessing you right now. Well, now it's important also to have a clear picture about how big is the market? How is the this market? How are the trends and dynamics in this market? And the investors uh, want to know how well you know it, uh, how you have calculated this market. How is your um, sales uh, positioned in, the, in this market? It means what will be your market share when the uh, business will be completely operational. Calculate the market, please calculate the market in a bottom-up approach from your clients, from the number of clients do you want to achieve, at the price that you expect to, to sell and how it will be growing. It's nice to have a picture about uh, what is the market, what the market is, top down. It means you can search in a big study what is the potential market for um, all of your business uh, worldwide. It's good, this big number about billions, but also calculate from bottom to to the top, how will you reach this uh, big goal? Next one, competition, what the others are doing. Please never say that I have no competitors. competitors. I am the unique on that. Don't say that. Show why you are unique and why you are different from the competence because sure, I'm sure that uh, other people have been thinking, have been creating a business similar to the one you aim to, to bring to the market. Well, another important thing is what is your business model? What will be your revenue model and how will you make money? This is important for the investors. They want to know why what type of uh, rev revenue are you planning? You are planning, um, if you have a software, maybe you have a monthly recurring revenue uh, for subscription to your software, or maybe you have a license agreement if you are more dealing with hardware, or uh, maybe you are selling a small product for final customers in a B2C business. What is the price? Is this unit? How do you compare with, um, with competence? Are you cheapest or are you positioning in premium category and you have a expensive uh, price, but uh, with a lot of functionalities um, that make you feasible to enter in the market? Uh, investors, uh, uh, sorry, uh, also show if you have validated this revenue model with the market? Is the market ready for your prices and your business model? Is the market willing to pay for you? Something that you have to state very clear in your pitch. And then uh, you are a startup. 
investors want to see this um, hockey stick uh, profile on your sales? How will you ramp up your sales in the next five years? And this is a matter of scalability. How will you scale your business? Uh, in which achievements you will support to provide credibility about this uh, uh, scalability? Is feasible, is possible, and is plausible? And also, if you maybe not in the early stage, but in the more mature stage, you have to talk about the, your business metrics, how you aim um, to have this uh, customer retention, the customer acquisition, what are the costs, what is the monthly recurring revenue, all of these metrics is, are very relevant to the investors. And also, what are the risks you are facing on creating this business? Show the risk. It, it's not a weak point to have risk. It's a strong point because you have identified it and accompanied this risk with your mitigation plan. And finally, do not forget to explain to the investors how will you expend the money they are bringing to your, to your business. And finally, conclude, have a conclusion uh, and bring them one takeaway, three takeaways something that uh, make the investors to remember of you. And I am going to do it now because we are writing at the, at the end of the pitch there uh, of my presentation. And well, those are my three key messages. If you are um, building your story, remember it's not only about rational, it's emotional, keep it in mind. Second, build credibility, supported on real facts, on achievement, and go in a stepping stones, crossing the river. Um, and finally, uh, well, if you are preparing your pitch deck, your slides, and if you have an opportunity of have of, of um, if, or, and if you have traction, if you have partners, if you have someone that have already trust on you, show to the investors that another people have already trust on you. That's all from my side. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Laura. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's good to have an, an overview uh, how, how, which are those uh, key elements to consider when preparing the, the the uh, the presentation to an investor, for example. So you were mentioning um, exactly that uh, teams are a, a key uh, part of the of the business, not not only the the numbers and the the profit that you can achieve, but in that sense, um, what would you recommend to our colleagues that are um, addressing or trying to uh, to reach uh, different kinds of um, uh, investors or uh, companies that uh, trust in their idea. Besides, not only about the, uh, I mean, going right now from, from your experience with uh, different startups, um, you have experience on innovation, for example. So how does uh, innovation, it's uh, getting really mainstream on this uh, and, and leading, uh, reaching as well, at the same time we were commenting with Tanya and Kwame, these uh, sustainable challenges, no? societal challenges plus environmental. So if you can, if you can give uh, in a glance uh, how this, of course, gives an added value, but uh, some uh, examples that, that you could share of uh, successful stories. Yeah, in fact, um, innovation in, in the green technologies, um, in, in, in green technologies and all of the, um, uh, all of the topics related uh, for energy transition, for instance, for climate uh, change mitigation, uh, also for the, um, for the, to, to tackle all the climate changes that are happening and how to address, for instance, the, 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 uh, the phenomena that happens on the climate and how affects um, 
this risk. Um, also, all of the uh, topics related with uh, green energy, batteries, hydrogen, new technologies, all of these topics that are related also to, that, that requires deep innovation to, to succeed in the market um, now are crucial. Now are crucial um, not only for private investors, but also for the public investment. Uh, because they are very aligned with the policies in the European Commission, for instance, um, to bring all of these innovations in the society uh, and to bring this research to the real market to enable a transformation of the society. Um, there are, on one side, there is the public in, in investment from the European Commission that through the policies is uh, pushing this kind of innovations. But also there is the private investors that are um, focused on, on sustainability. Also because um, they want to be aligned with ESG, ESG principles and, and they want to bring the money uh, towards this transformation of the society uh, to more um, clean future, more sustainable future, more sustainable future align also with the United Nations goals. Then um, to sum up, I think there is there is money, there is money from pri private sector, from public sector, and this money is trusting on entrepreneurs, on brave entrepreneurs that will accelerate this transition and this integration of deep, te deep technology in the society because they have um, a more um, fast read than the big corporations. And then it's a, yeah. an opportunity for them, I think. And for example, because uh, of course, uh, most of our colleagues are from uh, Egypt, Lebanon, and Tunisia. So how do you envision um, a common partnership probably uh, and how this uh, entrepreneurship around the region could also have um, opportunities to to uh, to encourage themselves or to uh, if there is a especially for those that are having an internationalization uh, strategy well in fact um, most of investors or well some uh, my recommendation is okay go to your country uh, go go local first. Go local. Understand local. What are the opportunities local? Start from local, um, from your your public authorities locally, and maybe with your few uh, investors locally. So I, I understand sometimes the ecosystems in certain countries are not so mature that in other other countries. You now it's not the the same. Uh, in in maybe I don't know. Uh, for instance, in Spain, it's not the same as in the in Israel. Uh, ecosystem in Israel is more mature than ecosystem in Spain. This is the situation. Then my uh, my my recommendation is start local, but then go global. Uh, nowadays, through internet, through LinkedIn, through social media, we have the opportunity co to connect to a lot of investors globally. In the United States, in Europe, in China, maybe in, in other countries in, in Asia, depending on the on the location of the entrepreneurs. And uh, also for the investors, it's the same. The investors, the venture capital start local, but they start to open global and they start to go um, to another countries. Then uh, my recommendation is. Mm, look, uh, look what is on the on the scene, and look at what is the approach of the different investors, and and then uh, try to 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 knock the door of those that are aligned with your your approach. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Laura. So I will ask uh, for our colleagues Tania and Kwame if you can open your cameras. Uh, there is uh, one question um, from our, uh, actually from uh, our colleague Yagane. Uh, it's for Tania, but also if uh, Kwame or Laura, you want to uh, give your impression. So uh, Tania, how can uh, we obligate uh, financial actors to go green and avoid the business as usual model currently uh, practiced, as uh, you will mention before? 
So do we have examples of uh, good practices in terms of monitoring green investments and assess their efficiency? Uh, well, um, we know that some financial actors, they like big banks, they, they, they announce billions and commitments to environmental finance. Uh, into green investment. But um, in terms of uh, examples to monitor, monitoring those commitments and to obligate them to change the course of business as usual to something that actually fulfilled the, the needs of the green investment and the green um, economy, for example. Um, what can I say is that, um, for example, in the European Commission, we, they, not that they are obligate in the way that um, to practice, they, they set a, a long list of um, policies and frameworks to implement it. But at some point, for example, for uh, any bank to, they try to go to, to the core activity of the bank if they, uh, they finance, uh, for example, fossil fuels, they will have more risk, they need to retain more capital, they will less productivity. So they go into the core of this, those banks, it's certain way kind of condition, con create a condition to make them choose a different path. Um, and, and there's a duality between the the, the the banks, the financial institutions, and even uh, the companies, because, uh, for example, um, they are the obligation to be companies that uh, explain that um, present their their sales and their um, turn green turnover. So that information also fits the banks that also try to reach in terms of investment. But there is no kind of, um, well, there is a lot of monitors, but they are from NGOs. And so that kind of exp that expose this. Um, one thing that is important is to uh, look at those players and those, those actors, those financial actors and see what they um, disclose in terms of public information on their reports. And so we can, Build um, build information for themselves to understand who he who is in the run for green investments or not. So, certain way there are some examples in the, in the in the Europe's that could be looked at it, uh, and could be helpful to to transfer the same to different areas. Okay, so like like you in which sectors, Tanya mainly. In terms of, I was saying, in terms of financial actors, like financial mm -hmm. institutions, we have, for example, um, the, the some big banks that actually don't um, that only go for a small thing of um, fulfillment of those needs, and have the kind of banks that fulfill more of those needs. They are with different. Um, they have different values. They don't, the ma their main thing is not maximizing the profit, which is this uh, dual um, actors that can carry on with this kind of investment and funding. But um, these are the financial, the financial institutions, but we also have the, 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 you know, the European Commission that is over, um, that is monitoring how they doing and um, asking for more information and uh, things that could um, affect their productivity, which means they could um, do better. And actually, if they say they are sustainable, they could act like a sustainable bank. Okay, thank you, Tanya. Um, I don't know for this, if uh, Kwame or Lara want to remark something. Maybe well, I, I, I can add some ideas as well. From the um, private uh, investment, from the venture capitalists, it's very difficult that uh, somebody oblige a venture capitalists about uh, how they have to do with their money at the end. But it's a reality, it's a dynamic of the market, it's a trend. 
that at the end of venture capital capitalists are um, they, they they do their activity to their lead partners lead partners are those people individuals that have put a money in a venture capitalist uh, and and the venture capitalists have to invest this money in startups and and business um, opportunities well, and in fact, the lead partners, the, the individuals, the, the private ones, they, it's a trend, it's a reality that the people wants that their money uh, is invested, will be invested in clean, in, in clean technologies, in energy transition, in business aligned with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Then I think it's a trend on the market, it's an opportunity on the market uh, for venture capitalists to, uh, in fact, uh, have the roadmap, have the strategy aligned with this kind of investments uh, nowadays. How they do then, there are, there are a lot of examples, there are a lot of venture capitalists that they state in these investment, in their investment thesis, and they make it public in in the website that they only invest in sustainable business uh, because at the end it helps them it's making now maybe now it's only a marketing strategy but it helps them to attract money from the from the individuals to to later invest this money in startups Yes, of course. Thank you, Laura. So in a way, it uh, would be good to trace, to have a track of these uh, and monitor which are those uh, entities that are following uh, these uh, criteria and to also as um, to make to make to make an, a good impact and to uh, attract others to to follow the same. Mm -hmm. So just to uh, because we're close to to the end, I think we uh, okay. Let me ask. Um, so there's another question from Shadi Constantin. Um, she said, uh, "As uh, part, for my understanding, each entrepreneur should solve a problem, and his idea must be unique in order to attract investors, and his idea must be concise and credible to the audience." Yeah. Yes, I think it's what Laura was uh, explaining before. Good summary. Uh -huh. Yeah, <laughs> good summary. Good understanding. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, so yeah. I think uh, one of the of the biggest questions, probably, or the um, of the concerns uh, when when dealing with uh, with different uh, uh, kind of um, opportunities to find uh, not only to build a networking, because also what you're commenting is how uh, the partners, you no, know, the partnerships that you build around your business. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think it's uh, I would like to to raise you your your opinion and to have a, a remark about. Um, how relevant is uh, this uh, inside the um, the company or the the organization, the the team effort, of course. But then, how to uh, this make more um, this monitoring about the the good impact that you're creating? How should be the 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 best channels to to drive? Because we could think about uh, indicators, monitoring, so showcasing your performance. Or could be, as you were mentioning, Laura, more in a marketing point of view, or uh, should be more even a, as a policy or as a, a distinct distinction that you uh, achieve, uh, you know, like a, like a distinctive uh, by uh, any uh, uh, reliable uh, organization giving you the, the, you know, to that you, you are achieving these uh, approaches. So I would like to know from from your side and your experience, what do you consider would be the the best and probably the the tendency on on visualizing these impacts? Well, well I sorry, no, go ahead, Laura. Yeah. Well, there is not only a, a, a point. The the good thing is to if the entrepreneur has it in his culture, in his essence, and and his nature, put in the in the strategy have it clear in the business plan and try to, to go uh, through all of the different channels. You know? uh, what channels they have? One is metrics. Make public your metrics, your achievements in your website, in your social media, in your communications. 
Other is attend to acceleration programs. It's very important. Attend to acceleration programs in, I don't know where, uh, internationally, in the country, in the city, that it's interesting, that are aligned with sustainable development. Go there because attending to acceleration program of this type will give you a, first a mark like a stamp and secondly will connect with with investors with par, with partners with potential clients with that culturally if in in the same mindset as you related with sustainability and um, also about uh, when you are looking for venture capital money um, well, there, there are a lot of source of information, list of venture capital, uh, list uh, description, and try to connect with the venture capital that are aligned with your culture. At the end, it's not only money, it's smart money. And it's the make that will put you on your boat. Uh, then try that this, this, this partner is aligned with your culture. Uh, also, I want to suggest or, or recommend a, a good uh, certification that it's named B Corp. B Corp is a certification for, for companies. Maybe you have been talking about that in your, in your project. And B Corp, it's a general uh, certification that helps to build your strategy align uh, with uh, ESG principles. And it's a very good. Uh, thing for, for entrepreneurs and startups. Thank you, Laura. Uh, Kwame, do you want to add or we uh, hear the question from Chadi? I think we can go ahead and hear the question from Chadi. Okay. So, because we have a uh, Chadi, please, if you want to raise your question. I think you're muted. Uh, no, no. Uh, it's yeah. okay. Uh, so I think I make mistake. I raise my hand. This is, ah. uh, but uh, it's a useful uh, webinar in terms of information and knowledge. And uh, I get a, con a good conceptual uh, how to make a pitch deck. Uh, so you can provide uh, the material in order to prepare our pitch deck in order uh, uh, to pitch uh, in a professional way. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah, the so material, you will have it, yeah. Oh, okay, amazing. So, Chali, one question. So, you're, uh, if you can give us in a glance, which is the kind of a business idea that you're developing? Uh, me, uh, e-commerce uh, platform. Uh, so, for me, uh, I, I sell Mediterranean uh, outfit, uh, souvenirs. This is uh, my idea. Uh, so uh, I cover uh, for the moment the, uh, the MENA region, let's say uh, Lebanon, Jordan, this is, but I want to expand uh, outside uh, uh, Beirut or outside, uh, I, make, I want to scale my business internationally, let's say to Europe, to, to France, to, to Spain, Italy, this is. Very good, Charlie. So yes, I think that this uh, it's it's relevant to to feed on this uh, to create the value. I don't know if uh, Kwame Tanya, do you want to to uh, to raise a final remark? Maybe I'll take. I mean, I'll go back to the earlier point. I mean, I thought we didn't have time, so I wanted to uh, just. But the key takeaways that I, I just want everybody on this session to go away with one includes that this ESG is real. And is relevant okay how do we say that if you if you look at the presentation that i went through there's a significant trend in terms of money that's being allocated for green related issues so and the, and the growth is astronomical so as an entrepreneur for you to really play a part in that and i think laura and tina as i mean have both said, said it you have to be clear with your strategy and how you do it I mentioned earlier, it's not a sprint. You're not going to go, go there from today to tomorrow. It's, it's, it's a medium to long-term gain. But you need to demonstrate the commitment that, first of all, you, are, you, you understand the principles or you are seeking to understand and you're going on that trajectory. More importantly, I think if you 
look at putting together a strategy and you attempt to implement it, the rewards will come. The opportunities are there. I mean, the challenge is that there's a lot of players now trying to regulate and put out information. But I think, as, as, I, as I said in my presentation, as we move on to next year or so, I believe that there'll be a lot of consolidation around the principles in terms of what to measure, how to measure it. But that stamp that Laura talked about is important. You need to be seen as an entity that is relevant in the ESG space. And if, you, if you've seen as that, I mean, the examples are many. I, I, I said in my presentation that there's a company here in Ghana that got significant cuts on interest rates for borrowings huge in, the, in Europe. And all they had to do was demonstrate alignment and, uh, and compliance thereof for certain ESG principles that they set and agreed at the beginning of the project. Uh, and, and they were very successful. So thank you all for the opportunity. Thank you, Kwame. Tanya, final remark from your side, please. Thank you. Uh, well, from my side and agreeing and both of the colleagues said um, most of the things, but yes, it's important to bear in mind the environmental, social and governance aspects of the business. Try to understand which are their main goals and principles and values and, and be loyalty to it in a way that don't go for a one size fits all and certainly go go there and try to you know um try to put him in a greenish way just try to understand what is the purpose of the business and um find the right people to work and to pursue that business to concretize in something that uh, actually make the difference in terms of sustainable development. Thank you, Tania. So thank you very much for, for the three of you. I don't know if uh, my colleagues, Jagane uh, or Rim, they want to raise any further comment. Um, um, all is good from my side. Just there is one uh, point in the Q&A. Um, yeah. That somebody wants the link for B Corporate. Uh, certificate. It's from Noor. Oh, yes. If uh, you can have the, yeah, maybe, uh, yes, we can, we can find it and share it with you. I think uh, Laura commented this about the B Corp certificate. Okay, so just to remind to everybody, we will, uh, we will share with you the, the record of this session and uh, the presentations, of course, from uh, Kwame, Tanya, and, and Laura. And um, just to thank you uh, on behalf of all the InvestMed uh, uh, project, and um, especially from Lumsa University and EMEA, they have been uh, working on this uh, series of uh, seminars. And uh, we will come back with uh, upcoming activities and we will let you know. So if uh, we already have uh, the, the list of contacts, so uh, we will uh, reach you and, and give you which are the upcoming activities. And, and also remember to, uh, to be on the investment platform. I think that, um, that it's uh, going to be a good uh, way to also continue uh, interacting with uh, your colleagues during the training cycles, but also from the other training cycles of, uh, of the other editions. So, Thank you very much to all, Tania, Kwame, and Laura, and I uh, hope you have a, a good day, and uh, see you soon. Fantastic. Have a good one. Okay. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice day. Bye-bye.